I request Professor Afzal Khan to please come to the dais and start the lecture. Thank you. Prof. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, National University, who's just left the hall. Obviously, he has uh, pressing uh, engagements at his office. The Honorable Council General, uh, Professor Amna Kishore, the senior faculty in the Department of English, Dr. Shagufta Shaheen, the co-coordinator of this uh, two-day national seminar on comparative literature, dignitaries from various uh, departments of this university from various parts of the town, my friend Siddhi Kali, and uh, members of the faculty and student friends. I feel uh, singularly honored that the head department of English and his colleagues in the department thought of inviting me, extending an invitation to me to be in your midst this afternoon and share some of my notes with you all. The morning session, I also must uh, apologize to the organizers that uh, I could not be present throughout the inaugural session when Professor Amna Kishore was addressing the gathering and was offering her introductory remarks. The loss is entirely mine. But in the later part, I have listened to her very attentively. And let me be very honest that having listened to such a lucid, comprehensive, and elaborate presentation on issues in comparative literature and comparative areas of comparative study, I think my keynote address could be very easily taken as a footnote to all that address. Well, uh, since we have a large number of uh, student friends attending this conference, I'd like to open up my address with a few interesting questions that we have not asked ourselves. In uh, addressing literary disciplines and areas of knowledge that we intend to promote, that we intend to institutionalize, and then we propose to develop in various universities in our country. The first question that I have to ask, and since uh, the Vice Chancellor has specifically suggested that we address ourselves to the student fraternity, we must ask ourselves, why do we need comparative literature? In the age of globalization, in the age of multiculturality, multiculturalism, in the age of liberalization and market economy, how does comparative literature become a relevant discipline to be instituted, to be promoted, and to be supported in our educational institutions? Is it because that some of us, the senior faculty in various departments of this country, intend to develop subjective proposals and subjective projects on these areas? Or is it because comparative literature studies and the areas allied to this could help us in developing certain 
confluential platforms. Can we arrive at some kind of a confluence here of various branches of knowledge, of various areas of study within literary studies, of various literary genres for that matter? Because uh, if you look at our syllabi nationally, if you look at the literature syllabi in our country of various universities in different states across the country you find that our syllabi is proliferated by courses courses in critical theory courses in women's studies courses in marginality courses in multiculturalism courses in ethnic studies, courses in disciplines where the production of reading material in our own country is absolutely worth the asking. Compared with the kind of uh, reading material that people have been produ producing in uh, language studies for that matter. We rely very heavily either on the classical Western tradition that uh, Professor Amna Kishore was referring to, the German school, the French school, the American school, or in more recent times, obviously, the Scandinavian school, referring, of course, to people like Bakhtin and uh, Tuan Wan Jit and others. But have we done anything, if I am Correct. Except for two major institutions in this country, the Department of uh, Comparative Studies and Southeast Asian Center for Southeast and East Asian Studies at Jadhavpur University, set up and developed by very eminent professor in comparative studies, Professor Amiya Dev. And the Chennai Institute of uh, Tamil, Sanskrit and other Indian languages. We do not have major institutions in our own country which uh, have adequately trained faculty, adequate knowledge resources, adequate funding for that matter from either the University Grants Commission or from HRD or from other central agencies to strengthen and empower these institutions. And still we talk about the development of comparative literature programs. I'm sure all of you are uh, familiar with, uh, I hope most of you in the audience know Urdu as well because I'd be referring to that very frequently. If we know the 19th century Indian tradition of scholarship, it was assumed that for a scholar, not necessarily a teacher, please remember that, working in an educational institution and being paid the six pay commission, it was necessary to acquire a higher level of competence in Sanskrit, Arabic, Persian, Mathematics, Astronomy, Logic and Medicine. The, of course, we cannot, it's not, I'm not speaking out of nostalgia and we cannot res resist change. But even if you resist change, the process of change does not stop. Things have changed, the world has changed. If you look also at the state of arts and humanities in most of the universities and uh, colleges affiliated to these universities, you would find 
that the enrollment of students in arts, humanities, is slowly going down. Our best talents are going to IT, engineering, medicine, finance, management. If you just take an assessment of what's happening to the educational sector, sector you realize that the best of talents are going to engineering, they are going to medicine, they are going to IT, to management and banking, banking and insurance services. The arts and humanities, the enrollment in arts and humanities is slowly going down. And that has very seriously affected the growth and development of humanities and social sciences as well. Over the years, over the past 20 years, this is a common scenario throughout the country. We are aware of uh, the constraints, the compulsions, and also the necessity. In the struggle for survival, people have to equip themselves with new skills, new areas of knowledge, new branches of knowledge, and nobody can resist it, and we have to understand that too. But what has happened, just imagine, Languages like Sanskrit, if there is a, is a department, if most university departments too, if the enrollment for the department of English, obviously because of the uh, market necessity, is 100 on 100, the enrollment in the department of Sanskrit is 6, 7 out of 100. The enrollment in the department of Arabic in university departments, Colleges is a different status altogether. The choice of Arabic as a secondary subject in colleges is a different reason altogether. But in postgraduate departments, the enrollment in Arabic has also gone almost 80% down. In Persian, it's almost disappeared. Remember, right up to the 1970s and 1960s and 70s, Persian was a very, very important language. And most universities had independent departments of Persian. Usmani University, the department of Persian and uh, Islamic studies. I don't think Maulana Abul Kalam Azad University has an independent department of Persian, department of... You have an independent? I'm very happy that you still have a department, but the enrollment, I'm sure, is very poor there. General, I'm speaking of general. The, the, this th these things that our interest in humanities is slowly going down. And people are taking more and more to technical courses, to engineering courses, to management courses. If this is the general state of things, then the, the question you know, <coughs> one has to <coughs> ask oneself again and again, do we have valid, justifiable reasons to develop an area of study that we know as comparative literature or comparative studies as an independent discipline? Do we need to institutionalize that discipline? Do we need to promote research in that area? Do we need to develop research projects in that area? And if we do, have we asked ourselves as a nation, as a country, why do we need it in our country? Do we have a national justification for that? I think it is time that we take stock of things, reassess things and define where exactly have we gone wrong. We've been talking about colonization and uh, the even a cursory glance at the kinds of dissertations that are being written, the MPhil and PhD level, you can see a majority of them focus on post-colonial studies, diaspora studies, ethnic studies. Do we have enough projects in comparative studies in the university departments too? And why is it this happening? You know, there's an argument, obviously. People say these comparatists who have been working for or a, 
years in this area suggests that, well, a comparatist like a linguist need not know the languages he is uh, working with. You can work on a hypothesis and then that within a language, like you work within a language on various tenses and various uh, grammatical structures or syntactic or semantic structures within comparative literature as well, is not necessary to know the languages or li the literatures that you are trying to compare. But don't we think, I mean, this is a very open question that we must ask ourselves, that literature is finally the finest kind of cultural product, like music, like dance, like painting, like songs. Isn't literature a cultural product? And if it is a cultural product, it is necessary that we understand that, that the base, the roots of literature, these cultural configurations enter directly or indirectly, knowingly or unknowingly. If you read 19th century poetry, 20th century poetry, poets constantly borrow from music. Constantly borrow from painting, constantly borrow from dance. And if you do not know, but there is a there was a seminar at uh, University of Jadavpur on comparative literature, and I think this is one of the, one of the most uh, uh, scintillating event that the Jadavpur University had organized. They did not focus in that seminar on literature as an independent literary genre or a discipline. They brought in people from dance, they brought in people from music, they brought in people from um, singing, gaiki. For instance, now let me give you a very simple example. The kind of conference that was achieved by the end of the 19th century, most of our Indian comparatists forget that we have a very rich tradition. Dara Shiko translated most of the Sanskrit texts into Arabic and Persian. Kosambi was a multi, he was a polyglot. Dara Shuko was a polyglot. And the works done by people like Kosambi and Dara Shuko are museumized. They are left abandoned in archives. People are not ready to go back to the works of Dara Shuko. The kind of conference that we had achieved as a result of this kind of an Indian renaissance in the 19th century, where languages, without ever confronting each other, and linguistic differences without ever confronting each other, syntactical and semantic differences without ever confronting each other, arrived at a kind of an inclusiveness, at a kind of a confluence. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the kind of uh, uh, poems that Amir Husro wrote. Nobody has attempted to study how Amir Husro's poetry and his music attempt to establish the significance of a cultural confluence. And I believe personally that Amir Khusro, some of the poems that he wrote, reach a point of cultural confluence uh, which has never been crossed over again. The kind of Indian sensibility that Amir Khusro could uh, finally master, internalize, the kind of sensibility that he could internalize. For instance, uh, when, when his uh, Murshid, Hazrat Nizamuddin Awliya, died, a man who knew Persian and who wrote, of course, he has five collections of poetry in Persian, independently. But when he wrote in the Indian languages, in the Hindustani, at the death of his Murshid, whom he loved so much and who loved him so much, and who at the time of his death said, if had Shariat allowed, 
I would ask Amir Khusro to be buried with me. At the death of that master, Amir Khusro does not speak in Arabic or Persian. He says, Gori soe sej par mukhpar dare kes chal khusro ghar apne saanj bhai chaudes. It's a kind of the peak, the point of confluence that the Indian sensibility reaches. And then you have this famous Zehale Miski, Mangum Tagaful, Duraya Naina Banaya Vatiya. Shabani Hijra, Daras Chuzul, Ke Roze Visla Chum Rukota, Sakhi Piyasu Jomayana Dekhu, So Kaise Kaatu, Andheri Ratiya. One is purely Persian. Ke Shabani Hijra, Daras Chuzul, Ke Roze Visla Chum Rukota, Pure Persian. Absolutely chaste, impeccable kind of a Persian idiom that Amir Khusro had mastered and could write in. And then the Indian, Sakhi Piya Sunju Maina Dekhu, To Kaise Katu, and Heri Isn't that a point of confluence in our history? What lessons have we as comparatives taken from? Those points of confluence in our own history available to us. And those points of confluence, I believe, both as a student and as a teacher, we remember we have to retell those confluences. We have to retrieve those confluences. If we want to strengthen departments of comparative literature, if we want to establish that as an independent discipline, if we want comparative literature departments to work rigorously and seriously and develop this discipline into an independent academic discipline, I think those points of cultural conference need to be brought back, need to be retrieved. And unless we retrieve that, we will not develop an indigenous tradition of comparative literature. We keep talking about influence studies, Translation studies, textuality, contextuality. We'll keep talking about the subaltern, we'll talk about marginalization, but we'll not be able to develop an indigenous tradition of comparative literature. In order to develop an indigenous tradition of... What has happened to... Just imagine the kind of comparisons that are possible in film and literature. We need to study the way Bisham Singh Sahani's Tamas Kushwan Singh's train to Pakistan was translated into a different idiom altogether. The narrative literature, and of course you have the Western resources also available. You have the famous book, Story and Discourse, which tells you how to deal with these mediums. These are available. Partition narratives, for instance. Bhishim Singh Sahani, Manto, we talk of the magic realism of Milan Kundera, of Maria Losa. We talk of Borges, the ma magic realism. What has happened to the stories of uh, Intezar Hussain? What happened to the stories of G.K. Kulkarni in Marathi? They have adequate level of realism attached to them. And what happened to the stories of Alif Laila? I mean, it's very interesting. That Zoltan Todorov, when he writes the poetics of prose, he elaborately uses resources from the Arabian Nights. The whole book, Poetic of Prose, is based on the retelling of and analysis of the tales from the Arabian Nights. It's a very fascinating tale. I am tempted to tell that story if you permit and if you be patient with him, with me.